Tay Savage, real name Dwayne Timberlake, spent his first years with his grandmother in the Auburn Gresham neighborhood around the streets of 76th and Racine. This is located in the far south side of Chicago. I'm from Wilkes, you know, I'm originally from 76 and Racine, Rock Island, you feel me? That's where I really was born. My, my grandma and stay like they from 76 and Racine, and my, my granddaddy and them was like on the low end. That's how I came to Wilkes or whatever. But I go back all summer, be with them all summer, whatever. Or, you know what I'm saying? I ain't, any break, I go kick it while. She really raised me, to be honest. My grandma, well, she, you know, at, when, when I was little. Baby, baby, whatever. She really, so I really stay well for most of the time. But. A territory of a gang known as Rock Island, who are made up of mostly conservative vice lords. Now, conservative vice lords are an interesting gang with a rich history. Considered to be the oldest faction of the almighty vice lord nation, the vice lords formed in 1957 when several African American youths moved from Mississippi to Chicago, coming together while incarcerated and recruiting others to join their gang and ultimately engaging in conflicts with other gangs or clubs in different Chicago neighborhoods. The Conservative Vice Lords was started around 1958 by the seven original founding members of the Vice Lords. The Conservative Vice Lords were essentially intending to soften the image of the overall almighty Vice Lord Nation gang. The Conservative Vice Lords styled themselves as more of a community outreach group, legitimizing their activities through Conservative Vice Lord Incorporated, often being referred to at these times as the socially conscious street gang. The guys over here in the Vice Lords, the people over here in the Lawndale area, want their piece of the pie. And they wanted to do their homework, like I said again, to get it. The conservative vice laws came as a result of some older vice laws uh, realizing that uh, the younger vice laws were breaking in houses in the community. Yeah, what's your problem, uh, Committing a lot of crimes, and they were getting violent. And it's like violence on the peoples in the community. And so they wanted to shut that down. Into the 60s, this faction became involved in different community outreach initiatives trying to prevent violence and crime and support positive change in Chicago's black communities. And CVL Incorporated would even receive grants from powerful funders like the Rockefeller Foundation to further their mission. However, as it would turn out, this didn't stop the street side of the Vice Lords continuing to run an illicit empire as a gang, consolidating other smaller neighborhood gangs into the almighty Vice Lord nation and running what was later described as a complex criminal enterprise running protection rackets, and murdering business owners who refused to be extorted. One of the Vice Lord's leaders, Bobby Gore, would ultimately end up being jailed for murder, and over the decades that followed, many fragmented Vice Lord factions would form in neighborhoods all over Chicago, with the heavily armed young members bringing violence to their neighborhoods, even telling the news in the 90s that they're ready to kill anyone who comes into their building. Meet the Vice Lords. We got 50 shot max, this small, we got Tex, we got 3030s. We got Uzi's. Just one of the many heavily armed street gangs in Chicago. Hey, we hunt whoever trying to hunt us. That's how it right. is. The gang survival. Right. You hunting people. Right. Anybody who trying to come through our building. If one of us go down, they going right. down if too. one of us go down, everybody got to go. This is the kind of environment that a young Tay Savage was growing up in, and despite hailing from the Vice Lord stronghold of Rock Island, apparently Tay would eventually be sent to live with his mother in the suburbs at the outskirts of Chicago, getting momentarily away from the dangerous gang-infested environment of the South Side. My pops was locked up most of my life, but my OG really was holding it down, you feel me? She had moved out to the birds, so I really was decent, you know what I'm saying? What suburbs was she staying in? I mean, I was all through the birds, like the, like the north suburbs, like okay. Aurora. I'll type all out, all out that way, Aurora, Hoffman Estates, Bartlett, you know what I'm saying? I was all through that. Then I started kind of getting got, getting out of hand, you feel me? So she sent me with my, my granddaddy or whatever. And then, you know, that's kind of, you know what I'm saying? I became on, a product of your environment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But Tay's behavior was getting out of hand, and eventually, after going back and forth from his mother and grandmother, Tay would eventually be sent to live in the low end where his grandfather lived, finding his new stomping grounds in a neighborhood run by a set of gangsters called the So Icy Boys, or Bird Gang, or So Icy Trap Boys. So Icy was made up of members with a heritage in both the Black Disciples and the Gangster Disciples street gangs, with many of the smaller gang sets in modern day Chicago being made up of a variety of people with heritage in different street gangs. As Tay explained himself in a No Jumper interview, interview, this gang didn't care about your original affiliations at all. So in terms of like, well, break it down for me, because they said when I was reading about your history and stuff that Welsh world contains GDs and BDs. Yeah, y'all. So man, we got a mixture. Like we got a mixture in our hood. You feel me? We got all type of stuff. BD, GD, fo I don't know. We got all types of stuff. We don't really care about that, to be honest with you. So you ain't gonna never just see us like, oh yeah, we super GDK. Now, little bro and them, they like most of them all BDs. Most most all like Bookie the G and all of them, they mostly all BDs. 
the guys like my age, it's all a mixture. Like we don't really care about that. We all 40th, 43rd, so icy, Welsh rural. The set So Icy likely got their name after Gucci Mane's first hit song with Young Jeezy by the same name, and the members were clearly already big fans of Gucci Mane, with Tay Savage himself being seen in early Facebook videos actually dancing to Gucci Mane's classic anthem, My Kitchen. And it would appear that members of So Icy had aspirations in the rap game too, with So Icy members recording themselves freestyling on the block. So Icy, we 40, you. catch us with that camera, 39, we taking over, all them Counterfeit, we gangsters in the making, dreaded like Jamaicans. First young actor, not that Christian, be spacing. So you know what we blazing. At your girl, how we're tasting. And little mama said amazing. So the Christian, man, who she dating? Be kicking in on 40. You know I got that 40. Plus, give me in rotation, cause the trigger has to short these traps out. So Icy's main territory was roughly between 40th Street in the north, 43rd in the south, King Drive in the west, and Cottage Grove in the east. And members of So Icy would regularly record themselves walking their strip and holding down their territory, as well as having parties on the block outside. This dude, uh, he can, he know he can do this all right, man. You know how we do that, man. So Icy Trap Boy, you must win the bill. No, he ain't bitch, man. So Icy Trap Boy, stand up, man. You are a big man, Fly Boy, Huffman, Fly Boy, Super Boy, Got Richie, aka King Star, man. You know what it is, yo. Yeah, the money over there, man. You should be out the honchos in the pocket, yo. No, you yeah, ain't money, man. Stop playing. <laughs> Before the meeting rock rise in 1999, Icy Trap Boy would be known as Icy Trap Boy. Icy Trap Boy, 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 but it has produced quite a few characters who ended up playing important roles in the rise of the drill movement. One of these people is Chicago rapper Billionaire Black, who was born and raised in the infamous Robert Taylor Holmes and later started hanging out with the So Icy members. You was born and raised on the south side of Chicago. Am I correct? correct? My boy, for sure. The low end. Exactly. To be specific, the low end. Uh-huh. Welch world? I was born in the Robert Taylors, raised down there, but yeah, I grew up in high school, all that. Billionaire Black has been rapping for a long time, years before the drill movement exploded onto the mainstream around 2012, with early songs of his more inspired by Atlanta rappers like Gucci Mane and Waka Flocka, which still circulate, having been recorded as early as 2008. Together with some guys from around So Icy's neighborhood, including rappers like Chopper Dagoon and his brother F Dot, they would start a rap group called the Buck 20 Brick Boys, who dropped their first music video in 2009, a track called I Really Lived Dat, where they would tell real stories of the grimy street life in Chicago. While a young Tay Savage wasn't yet rapping at the time, he could still be seen sometimes in the back of music videos and blogs by the Bug 20 Brick Boys. The Bug 20 Brick Boys eventually began to get a buzz in Chicago around 2010, helped partly by their music videos that already at the time looked relatively professional. This was actually thanks to the brother of F Dot and Chopper Dagoon, videographer D Gaines, who would later play a pivotal role in capturing some of the biggest moments in the Chicago drill movement, shooting music videos for many of the biggest rappers and songs in drill history, including many of Chief Keith's biggest songs, such as the video for the breakthrough hits I Don't Like and Love Sosa. He also did the video for Lil Durk's classic drill anthem, L's Anthem, and the song Right Here, which was Durk's first single after getting released from prison in 2012. And he would also record the video for FBG Duck's classic track, Hell Yeah. Buck 20 Brick Boys had connections all over the South Side, and they were linked up with numerous sets and rappers, including FBG Duck, who at the time still went by just Duck. S. Dot from 600, which at the time was still better known as Brick City, and surprisingly, Lil Durk from Lamron, who would later become bitter rivals with some of the members, most famously Billionaire Black, who of course ended up remaining much closer with the gangster disciple rappers from 63rd, like FBG Duck. But before all of that happened, Lil Durk was collaborating with the Buck 20 Brick Boys and shouting them out. Besides rappers, one of the key members of So Icy, and one of the most important characters in this story, was a charismatic young man by the name of Anthony Welsh. He would be seen representing his block in numerous hood vlogs alongside a young Tay Savage. Yeah, we 
talk about no the real deal. Welch and Tay would become the best of friends, both running in the streets together, each respectively racking up lengthy arrest records. With Tay receiving various charges from trespassing and reckless conduct to domestic battery and gun possession, while Welch would catch charges that included reckless conduct, trespassing, and manufacturing drugs. Tay and Welch were close and united in the battle to survive the difficult environment of life in the streets of Chicago's low end. The streets would be dangerous, and there would be numerous other gang sets operating in the low end at this time. However, because these sets existed before before Chief Keef and other legends of drill music brought the world's attention to Chicago gang culture, and before the gang members would record their every move on social media, there is generally limited information about these sets available today. Based on some of the social media activity by the So Icy members that did exist at the time, they were closely associated with a handful of other nearby sets. So Icy affiliates such as the Beam Team from around 39th Street, which would later become known as OBN or Oak Boy Nation, named after the Oakwood Shores Apartments, which is also the hood of the early female drill pioneer Katie Got Bands. So Icy were also close with 4624 Hit Squad or 46 Terror from around 46th Street which would later become known as THF 46 or the Trigger Happy Family. This is a set that has deep ties to famous sets like Oblock and Lamron, with one of THF 46's most famous members, Beizu, being a close friend of both Lil Durk and Von. There was also a small set in alliance with So Icy called Fifth Ward, which would later allegedly connect with THF 46. But there were also many other sets from around the low end that at least some So Icy members didn't get along with, such as the Rock Boys or Rock Nation that originated in the Ike's projects, where they can still be seen hanging in this video clip from 2008, not long before the demolition of the last of the project buildings. Later, the Rock Boys would eventually begin operating around the Dearborn Homes public housing projects, and interestingly, the Rock Boys were seemingly connected with Oblock, the Black Disciple Gang based in the infamous Parkway Gardens housing project, which was known in the streets at the time as Wick City. The name Oblock comes from a famous resident of Parkway Gardens that was gunned down by the name of Odie Perry. A member of the Rock Boys would even make a post on Facebook in 2020, suggesting that he was actually present when Odie Perry was murdered in 2011. It's never been definitively proven who actually killed Odie Perry and so-called created Oblock. What we do know, however, is that So Icy and the Rock Boys absolutely hated each other. In an old photo of Welch, he appears to be disrespecting the Rock Boys by showing their Jay-Z-inspired Rockefeller hand sign upside down. Another set known to be for So Icy is Lake Park, which would later become known as Sue Wu or TTB from around the Lake Park Avenue near the shores of Lake Michigan. They were seemingly also beefing with So Icy and would later become associated with the murder of one of their most beloved members. Lake Park members could also be seen dissing Welch by throwing down a W hand sign. Lawless is another low-end set that has beef with So Icy. The set is named after the Lawless Gardens housing projects, which sounds intimidating, but these projects are actually named after another distinguished black Southsider, internationally renowned black dermatologist and self-made millionaire Theodore K. Lawless. The Lawless set were also known at the time as Jamar World, named after their member Jamar Moore, who was killed in 2010. Now, Tado from Chief Keef's Glow Gang hailed from Lawless and can actually be seen here in front of a tribute to Jamar, and this affiliation would later lead to tension between Tay Savage and Tado. Also, infamous gang set 051 Young Money from the southern end of Bronzeville would also get into a heavy beef with So Icy and Welch World. And one of their most known rappers, Lil Mark, would actually diss So Icy in his classic 2011 drill song, Zico World, where he alludes to Young Money robbing the chain of billionaire Black, shooting him, and even smashing his girlfriend before further dissing So Icy and THF 46. Another rival gang set that plays a key role in this story is called The Av. The Av is a set that hails from around 37 Street and Indiana Avenue. And sometime later in this beef, people from the Av, Lawless, and the Rock Boys would all team up and represent together under the name 757. Many of the Av's members were actually Black Disciples, and according to some, many of them grew up in the demolished Ida B. Wells Homes and Madden Park Homes projects, both of which had Black Disciple strongholds. But some of the Av members also came from other projects that had ties to many of the other sets in the low end. In fact, in that 2008 clip of the Rock Boys in the Ike's projects, there's an appearance by one of the most loved members of the Av and one of the key characters in this story, a female gang member called Cess, a nickname that's a shortened version of her real name, Princess. And Cess would appear in a 2008 vlog recorded in the Ike's projects hallways. Say, Mom, this Cess, man. That's all I'm gonna say. I give a shout out to everybody from 30 motherfuckers, low end motherfuckers, production straight like they motherfuckers and the Iggy's. Yeah, these motherfuckers, motherfuckers. Don't think I flip flop because I'm staying 35th in the Iggy's. Yeah, these motherfuckers, 35th slash Iggy's, motherfuckers. Have a time going to the party, y'all. Gonna be for what? Cause we getting them up. Stop hating and get your weight up, mother. But sure, I'm the only female first lady in all this, and ain't nobody gonna take the top of my mother. That 
Straight like that, man. Straight like that is straight wrong. Bring y'all hoes. No, no, no. We got goons on deck for sure, sure, sure. Play with me, get hit in the nose, nose, nose. I keep that bread for sure, sure, sure. After leaving the Ikes, Cess would move to the app, or what they would call Burr Street, likely named after Gucci Mane's famous ad lib. Boo. With Cess actually having a daughter who became a rapper, Blasian Doll, who would later explain her movements as the daughter of a famous female gangster in her hood. Uh, what it was like growing up with me on the low end, well, you know, my mom was Cess, so. Yeah, she was a real street bitch, so I grew up all in the ghetto in the trenches, like the ickies and shit. Real trench, Then we was on 37 in Indiana, you know. I've been around guns and shit all my life. This shit, like, in me, for real, for real. What, what are your memories of your mom like? I remember, like, when we was younger, we used to live in the icky. She used to be, like, a drug dealer. I'm to ride with another AV member called Neef, real name Christopher Daniels, who can be seen in this hood vlog alongside Cess. Despite the two being opposite sexes, their relationship appeared to be platonic, and Cess was known to have boyfriends and baby daddies while still being out riding and sliding with Neef. In fact, at this time, Cess was already the mother to at least one child, and her daughter would grow up to become a female rapper by the name of Blasian Doll. Like the Buck 20 Brick Boys on the So Icy side, the Av would also have their aspiring rappers too. In fact, Neef and Cess themselves were seemingly also dabbling in rap, recording numerous songs together. Now, it's unclear when the beef between So Icy and the Av began, or exactly why, but most likely, as is often the case, it's a complex mix of generational beef passed down by the older members, as well as new beefs that developed between individuals from the newer generations of both gang sets. But what can be said with some level of certainty is that the animosity could go back to at least the mid-2000s, when a teenager named Stefan was killed. On January the 6th, 2006, the 18 year old was pronounced dead after being found with a gunshot wound to the chest, and that murder remains unsolved to this day. Although Stefan didn't seemingly live in the low end at the time of his death, he was killed around So Icy's neighborhood. And in the first So Icy Buck 20 Brick Boys vlog on D Gaines' YouTube channel from 2009, members of So Icy can be seen shouting out their fallen members, including Stefan. <laughs> Yeah, man. Rest in peace, and Stefan, man. You know how we get down, man, over here, man. Man, man rest in peace to the boo doing their thing, man. We get money out here, man. Real Ville, I'm telling you, this out here, man. We out here, man. This Crazy, According to the online detectives of Chiracology, the Av, including Neef and another member called Kenny Mack, may have had something to do with Stefan's death. As the years would go on, more and more rumours of Neef and Cess being involved in deadly violence in the gang war would spread, but so too with the involvement of Tay Savage, who would eventually get so deeply entrenched in the streets, people would begin referring to him as the bully, and a one-man army who would take out entire gang sets single-handed. Tay Savage has a reputation in the streets as a force to be reckoned with in Chicago's gang war. And this is a reputation that he's earned over years of battle in the low end's complex gang conflicts. Rumors of Tay Savage being a killer on his block go all the way back to 2008, with a notorious and since deleted wiki page focused on Chicago's gang wars, the War in Chirac wiki, containing an early theory on Tay's street activity. According to that wiki page, Tay was rumored to have killed a total of three people, being present for two other murders and having shot as many as 12 different people. The earliest murder that Tay's name has been associated with was an AV member or affiliate by the name of Kermaine. Real name Kermaine fears he was killed by an unknown assailant in December 2008, shot dead while sitting in a car outside of his home. And while it's tempting to attribute this murder to Tay Savage without evidence, simply based on his reputation as a savage in the streets, however, an alternative theory on who was responsible for this murder actually paints a different picture. Kermaine Fears is actually mentioned in a 2016 Intercept article exposing police corruption in Chicago. According to the article, during the 2000s, a CPD sergeant named Ronald Watts was running an extensive criminal racket, where corrupt officers led by him would extort drug dealers and receive payments in exchange for allowing them to conduct their business unscathed, as well as even apparently doing targeted hits on their rivals as favours. Kermaine was apparently one of the dealers caught up in this police corruption racket. He at the time ran his dealing operation from the Ida B. Wells homes, which, as mentioned, were the projects where many of the AV members eventually came from. After these projects were shut down, Kermaine would remove his operation to the AV's neighbourhood. But as the projects were now gone, so too were much of Kermaine's profits. And according to his girlfriend, this would cause Kermaine to refuse to pay tax to the corrupt cop Watts. And he had allegedly 
threatened to give Watts up to the feds. And then, only a few days after threatening to snitch on the corrupt cop, Kermaine himself would be killed by a shooter that would hit him a total of 17 times. And according to the word on the streets, this murder was the work of Watts rather than Tay Savage. But like many of the older stories about Chicago murders, with conflicting stories about who might have pulled the trigger, we may never know who really did it. It's unclear where the rumour of Tay being behind this hit comes from, but regardless, he was still known to be heavily involved in the streets around this time, and in the years that followed, things would get extremely hectic on his block. The year 2010 would turn out to be critical in the beef between So Icy and the Av. On the 2nd of April, a man named Jermaine Streeter would end up being shot and killed in the Av's neighbourhood. Jermaine was allegedly an older cousin of female Av member Cess and went by the name Maintain. Maintain was a loved member of the Av, and after his death, members would pay tribute to him on social media by posting photos of themselves wearing shirts with his picture, along with text saying, things ain't gonna be the same without Maintain, Av crazy. Reddit detectives would later theorize that the murder of Maintain was done by members of So Icy, specifically Tay's close friend Welch. And while the case remains unsolved to this day, what we do know is that in later police reports regarding the murders of Cess and Neef, Maintain's case is listed as a reference, confirming that at least the Chicago police considered that his murder was related to this beef between these two factions. The events following the murder of Maintain are somewhat murky, but what we do know with some certainty is that at some time in May 2010, Tay Savage himself would become a victim of a shooting. On the 14th of May, people close to Tay would post on their social media indicating that Tay had been shot, but fortunately, he would survive. Tay himself would talk about this incident in a Say Cheese interview, saying that the incident happened after they had gotten into an argument with some people on the block. And this is all, I mean, you're all outside just chilling. Yeah. And, I mean, you just weren't paying attention? He was outside chilling, some little words broke out, you know what I'm saying? Some we having words with people. And you know, one thing led to another, when shots rang out, I wind up getting shot. Then, in the early hours of the next day, Saturday the 15th of May, Tay's friends would post again, wishing him to get well and seemingly threatening the people behind the attack. But what they didn't see coming, however, was later that day, another one of their good friends would become a victim of a shooting as well, and unfortunately, he wouldn't make it. At around 7 p.m. on the night of May the 15th, police would be called to a shooting near East 40th Street in King Drive, and there they would find two males who had been shot. One of them would end up surviving with a leg shot, but the other male would be pronounced dead at the scene. It would turn out to be Anthony Welch who had been shot in the chest and left to die on the grassy patch between the lanes on King Drive, with the scene of the crime even being photographed as detectives combed for evidence as Welch's body lay in the grass. Later that night, a friend of Tay and Welch, who had just been posting about Tay, would post again, sharing her pain of losing a loved one, but also revealing an interesting fact about the actions of Welch leading up to his death. Apparently Welch had wanted to see the friend the day before his murder, but hadn't told her where he was going, which the friend would seemingly only find out after his death, making her wish that he would have let her know what he was doing. Now, this post starts to seemingly make more sense when a few years after the murder, a member of the AV would straight up admit that they killed Welch, even saying that they were the reason that detectives were on the block. Another member would then quote the song Now It's Over by Chief Keith, but with changed lyrics now indicating that Welch had come to their hood shooting, leading to him getting killed. The same story would be told again a few years later by a newer generation AV member and rapper Rono in the song Ballin, where he raps Burr Street, that's a danger zone, so be cautious, I remember Welch tried to shoot and run and phone him hawked him. Stories like this would lead to a rumour that Welch had actually gone to the Av's hood looking to avenge the shooting of Tay the day before, but unfortunately when he was there, members of the Av spotted him, chasing him and his friend on their way back to So Icy's hood, shooting them both on the spot and killing Welch. But even more interesting, allegedly the people that went after Welch were none other than the Av's Cess and Neef, with Cess acting as a driver and Neef as the gunman. Now, this theory was seemingly confirmed by one witness statement to the police claiming to have identified Cess as being the driver in the Welch hit. Even Tay himself would later talk about these events during one of his interrogations with Chicago police, saying to the cops outright that Cess being the driver on the Welch hit was indeed one of the theories. But Tay was not present for the shooting of his best friend as he would still be stuck in hospital, clueless that his friend Welch had lost his life. And this would be reflected in social media posts between the friends of Tay and Welch a few days after Welch's death, where they would discuss whether or not to even tell Tay about the tragic news of Welch's murder, with one of the friends urging the friend visiting Tay to tell the man the truth, while another urges to keep telling him that Welch is at her place, saying that Tay can't handle losing Welch at this tough moment. In his Say Cheese interview, Tay would recall the events, saying that it was eventually Welch's uncle who would break the tragic news to him. Now, I seen in the other interview, you said that they didn't tell you until like days later. Yeah, yeah. 
you were still in the hospital when they told you? Yeah, yeah. I was in the hospital and uh, critical. Mm -hmm. So they ain't want to just, you know what I'm saying? Tell me, so yeah. They waited, they waited till I got a little better than they, than they told me. And who told you? Like Welch uncle. Welch uncle told me, like he the one who, who broke the news, like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. he told me. Soon after Welch's death, other members of So Icy and friends of Welch would also begin to comment on his death on social media, some saying RIP and others vowing to get revenge and pledging to kill the whole projects belonging to those who were responsible. Two years later, describing Welch World as America's worst nightmare. They would also make numerous photo tributes to him and even posted a tribute video to Welch on YouTube, which has since been deleted. A female friend of Welch and Tay would post several messages in the days following Welch's death, saying how she needs Tay to come back home because Welch is not there anymore to look after her for him, and saying how she and Tay's other friends would hold him down through this heavy loss, calling him the realest guy that she has ever met, and saying how she prays others wouldn't have to live through such a loss, and being grateful that Tay had survived his shooting. She would also say that she was talking with Tay on the phone daily, and they were crying and praying together every morning. A friend of Welch would also plead on social media, asking for all of the sets in the low end to come together and stop killing each other as well as saying how Chicago had changed for the worse since the projects were torn down. About a week after Welch's death, on the 22nd of May, his funeral was held, and he was buried with a gravestone that included a picture of the Washington Nationals cap with the large W logo which Welch was known to wear, and which in the following years would come to define his set. The name of this set would seemingly change almost immediately following Welch's death, with Welsh World practically replacing the existing name So Icy by the end of May 2010, as members would agree that they were now known as Welch World. In June, one member would post on his social media, telling Tay to get in contact with him and insinuating that Tay was going through a lot due to Welch's death. But it's unclear if Tay was still in the hospital at this time. At some point though, Tay would get out, and according to himself, he was furious about the death of his best friend. And what was that, I mean, what was, did, was you angry? Was you, what was that feeling like? Yeah, I was angry, I was angry, furious. And you and Welch were like best friends? Yeah. Tay would later explain how this loss triggered something in him, turning him into a true savage. Like really after Welch died, bro, that shit, like, you know what I'm saying? Like triggered something in the mind, but. Tay would later respond to comments from 16 Shotham that during this time he had the low end walking on eggshells and became a one man army. I had seen somebody make a post basically saying like, this the man who had the, uh, almost like had the low end walking on eggshells and they called like a one man army. The murder of Welch would seemingly become a defining moment in Tay's life. And after this is when he would really begin to earn his nickname, the bully. Let me see. I think I really, really turned my bully up for real. I always was like, you feel me, like, doing my thing, but I really tell my bully I probably like the Welsh died. So I really turned my bully up. It would take less than a year for revenge to play out, but once he had recovered from the shooting, Tay Savage would return to the streets of Welsh World, ready to show the whole city exactly why they would call him Trigger Happy Tay. After the murder of his close friend Welch, Tay's gang became Welch World, and Trigger Happy Tay would get out of hospital and onto the warpath with hopes of avenging his fallen brother. He would eventually heal from his shooting, getting out of the hospital and back onto the streets of Chicago in 2010, and he would be seen on his block, surrounded by goons, who referred to him as a Welch World shooter in this throwback hood vlog. Man, we gonna hold this bitch down. Like, right here. Ain't never shoot. Yeah. He's trapped. Right, hey, look, look, look. My advice, you man. At the end of the night, try not to be guy, man. We out here. Later, in November of 2010, Tay would be back out on the streets, and on the 11th of November, he would be stopped by the police while driving with his friends on the far south side of Chicago. As Tay was asked to get out of the front passenger seat, he would try and flee and during a scuffle with the police, a handgun would fall from his waist. Tay would continue resisting the arrest, hitting an officer in the eye, but he was eventually taken down. Now, this encounter would actually come up later, once Tay's music career began to blow up, as some Redditors and YouTubers began accusing Tay of snitching, after he had allegedly tried to pin the gun on the driver of the car, saying that the driver of the car had handed the gun to him, with intense debate persisting over whether or not this alleged statement amounted to full-blown snitching. Tay himself would even recall this event during his No Jumper interview, but not mentioning any statements. What actually went down in the situation where you got caught with it? So, man, <clears throat> my cousin had called me. 
VME, he like, man, he got into us. So I'm like, all right, they come grab me. Long story short, we go over there, we we talk it out, because it, it, it was some guys from his block. So they talk it out or whatever, but when we leave, now bro forgot to cut the, the lights on of the car, so the police pulled us over. So when they pull us over, they, so I'm telling them like, man, take off, take off, you know, but he didn't really want to take off, but boom. So when they pull us over, they ask for lights and all that. So they tell us get out. So they tell us get out. I try to take off, you know what I'm saying? They grab me, slime me, all that. You know, I'm still trying to get away, but it was over with. They locked us up. They locked me up. They they looked at my address, but I, I had like a, a, a weird address. So they wouldn't need my address. They, so I'm, cause now, now I'm waiting. Now I'm like, man, what's going on? So, Cause you, usually it'd be like the next day you will go to the to, to the county jail. So now I'm waiting. They, oh yeah, the officer raiding your house. I'm raiding my house for what? And, yeah. While the full facts of this case remain unclear, what it does tell us is that Tay and his friends were riding around Chicago armed and up to no good. And as 2011 rolled around, Tay would again become entangled with the law, next time much more seriously. In the early morning hours of Saturday the 5th of February 2011, Sess and her sister were out partying with some friends on the south side of Chicago. They had just left a party in the Auburn Gresham neighborhood and were headed to another party on South Shore. But what they probably didn't know was that Gresham was Tay's old stomping grounds that he still frequented. And according to police paperwork, Tay was allegedly riding around with his friend that night when he spotted Sess in her car and decided decided to follow her. Sess's group arrived at the location of the second party around 2am, and after looking for a parking spot, they eventually parked across the street from Windsor Nursing Home. At around 2.05am, Sess got out of the car ahead of her friends, as she apparently had to use the restroom. But as she stepped onto the street, Tay allegedly appeared from behind her friends, running in front of her holding a handgun. Before Sess even had time to react to what was happening, Tay allegedly shot her twice, and according to police paperwork, once she was already laying on the ground, Tay would allegedly stand over her, saying, I told you, bitch, as he shot her several more times, leaving Sess bleeding out on the street as he next aimed the gun towards her sister and friends who were fleeing the scene in the car. Tay then allegedly shot at the car before fleeing himself on foot. Sess's sister and friends, who had fortunately escaped the scene unscathed, circled the block and then returned to help a wounded Sess who was then taken to hospital by ambulance. But unfortunately, her injuries were devastating and at 5.15 a.m., Sess would be pronounced dead and her murder would be reported the following day by local news who notified the public that there had been no arrests made so far. However, what we now know is that since the first incident report, Tay would be named as the main suspect. And in the days to come, following the murder of Sess, the police would seemingly find more information about Tay, making him a wanted man. However, for the time being, the cops seemingly didn't have enough evidence to bring charges, and Tay would remain free. Meanwhile, Sess would be laid to rest, and her friends would be left to grief, leading them to give their hood a new name, Sessworld. As far as police were concerned, Tay Savage was the prime suspect in the murder, and as far as the streets were concerned, Tay Savage had taken the first step towards avenging the murder of his friend Welch, with the fact that Tay was believed to be responsible for this brazen assassination circulating widely. With numerous people mentioning in interviews, they believed Tay to be the killer of Sess, the mother of rapper Blazendahl. The situation with him allegedly killing Blazendahl mama, I, I, I know he killed that girl mama. He shot at me. It hit different. Tay's reputation as a trigger-happy bully was already cemented in the streets of Welchworld. But after the murder of Sess, all eyes were on him. However, what would happen months later would end up making Tay Savage one of the most revered gangsters in Chicago history. Just over two months after Sess was murdered, on Sunday the 10th of April, at around 4.30pm, her friend she was rumoured to have killed Welch with, Neef, real name Christopher Daniels, was driving his car on the 7400 block of South Vincennes Avenue when he stopped at a traffic light. While he was stopped, a man would exit another vehicle in front of Neef before beginning to fire into the car. According to reports by Chicago police, the shooter was Tay Savage. Neef would then attempt to escape the situation by putting his car in reverse, but this would cause him to crash into another vehicle. Meanwhile, Tay would allegedly keep shooting into the car, hitting Neef several times, and then fleeing the scene with his getaway driver before the police and paramedics arrived. Unfortunately, Neef was already in serious condition and would be pronounced dead in the hospital soon after. This was the second shooting on the same block within two weeks, and one of over a dozen shooting that took place in Chicago over that weekend, leaving some of the locals afraid to leave their homes and fearful of what was to come next, while the police were likely already connecting the dots behind the scenes with regards to the killing of Neef. For the time being, there was once again no arrests, despite the shooting taking place in front of numerous witnesses. But both the driver and the shooter on the hit were both wearing ski masks 
masks that covered their faces. Again, members of the AV and other friends of Neef would react to his death on their social media, seemingly unable to believe that Neef had been taken out so soon after the killing of Seth. Known for riding together and now known for dying together, the loss of Seth and Neef so close to each other cemented these two as legends in their hood. And as Neef was laid to rest, the AV adopted the moniker CWNS, meaning Seth World Neef Streets. Meanwhile, after Neef's death, members of Welch World were also posting, one of them saying how it was time for them to get off the bench and play ball, with another member who would say that they would foul the whole team, to which another member would reply, yep, every last one. This seemed to suggest that Welch World's hitters weren't even done with their revenge campaign, even after killing two prominent hitters from the other side and avenging their friend Welch, who the gang had now been named after. They were keen to keep disrespecting their ops and stoking the beef. However, while Welch World was feeling boisterous after allegedly taking out the people who had killed their most loved member, their other enemies were also getting active. According to tweets by Welch World affiliates, about a week after the death of Neef, Tay would be arrested due to being suspected of numerous gun-related incidents, including the murders of Sess and Neef. However, it seemed that the police simply didn't have enough evidence to charge him for those murders at the time, and instead he would be charged with two attempted murders in relation to the other incidents, leading him to eventually beating those charges, instead receiving an 18-month sentence for aggravated unlawful use of a weapon. This would take him off the streets right when the war in the low end was getting scorching hot. I had two attempts, I beat them in 2012. Following Tay's arrest, Welch World members would post to social media saying free him and paying respects, posting photos of Tay in jail and even creating free Tay shirts. Unfortunately, while Tay was incarcerated, the already hot war in Welch World would get even hotter and even more complicated, as rivalries with numerous local gangs would intensify and affiliates would soon begin fighting amongst themselves. With Tay Savage, Welch World's most feared bully incarcerated, the members of the crew formerly known as So Icy would begin to bicker amongst themselves. One of these members would also post an angry message on Facebook accusing Welch World affiliated rap crew, the Buck 20 Brick Boys, of being fake for not paying for Tay's bond, despite acting like they were making money. The post would even get a reply from a member of their ops, the Av, who would actually laugh at Tay's predicament, saying that she wished Tay would die in jail and that he would be the next one killed. However, while Welch World's beef with the Av was escalating, they were by no means the only ops in the low end. Their other enemies included sets like Nearby Lake Park, aka Su Wu, and the 051 Young Money set, with both gangs dissing Welch heavily throughout 2011. In February, following the murder of Sess, a member of Young Money would post a highly disrespectful image of Welch's death site onto his Facebook, and in the comments, a member of Welch World would reply, saying that Young Money wanted to be just like them, to which the Young Money member would respond with a direct threat, saying he would be dead in three days. Rapper Lil Mark from Young Money would also participate in the conversation dissing Welch World as would a member of Lake Park, who were allegedly already clicked up with Young Money at the time, as was the Av, seemingly cool with both Young Money and Lake Park at this point. So Welch World had a whole collection of gang sets on their case at this time, all while their trigger-happy enforcer Tay was in jail. With that in mind, it was no surprise then that following back-to-back -back murders avenging Welch, soon Welch World would end up suffering another loss of their own. The month after Neef's murder on May the 11th, around 4pm, another beloved member of Welch World called Lil Tim, real name Timothy Wardlow, would be in Lake Park's neighbourhood at the 3900 block of South Lake Park Avenue when he was shot and rushed to hospital. He would unfortunately pass away the next day, with some members from Welch World beginning to refer to their area now as Tim Town or Dub Club, with Welch World Dub Club sometimes being referred to as WWDC from then on. There wouldn't be any reports of any suspects being captured immediately following the murder, but the police would state that several people were being questioned and a gun had been recovered. Surprisingly, it would turn out that Lil Tim was in fact a cousin of one of the Young Money members, and not just any member, but one of the most famous members, the rapper Driller. In 2014, Driller would even tweet about this fact, saying that it didn't matter because Tim was still an op. But the fact that the Av hadn't allegedly been part of the hit wouldn't stop them from participating in dissing Tim after his death. And after one of the Welch World members would post a tribute to Tim following his death, a member of the Av would comment, saying that Welch World members were sad now, but it didn't have any remorse after killing Sess and Neef, and now it was time for war. And wartime it indeed was, because while the Av had seemingly not retaliated immediately following the death of Sess and Neef, they were delighted with the infighting and external beefs that had caused their most hated enemies to lose one of their beloved members. And soon, the Av would be ready to make their own direct retaliation against Welch World for the murders of Sess and Neef. Retaliation that would sadly go wrong, leading to tragic consequences that left an innocent child dead. Thank you. 
Years after the deaths of Cess and Neef, people close to them have typically denied that Tay or Welch World in general were behind both or either of these murders. For example, in 2013, another brother of billionaire Black, called Richie Jerk, would exchange words with a member of the AV on Twitter, first saying, we made Cess World, to which a member of the AV would reply, and we made Welch World. But when Richie would say that they also made Neef Street, the AV member would deny this, saying they knew who really killed him. Similarly, years later when the daughter of Cess, rapper Blasian Doll, was interviewed by No Jumper, she would deny the allegation that Tay had killed her mum. But alright, so I'm sure you're aware of the reputation that your mom has because there's like multiple YouTube documentaries basically telling her story and everything. But it's like, like that. they not telling it right. What's what are they that, telling her? That's wrong? not I'll let, I feel like well I might as well just say the name since it's like he can cloud me. Uh -huh. I feel like Tay, he really like Tay Sap. pushing the mm. he never did it. That's why I keep saying allegedly, mm -hmm. allegedly did he. However, what we do know from very close sources is that after the murders in 2011, the AV very much considered Welch World to be responsible for both murders. Because what the AV didn't know at the time was that they actually had a police informant in their circle, a man named Keith Daniels, who was actually the older brother of Neef. According to a Chicago Sun-Times article about Keith Daniels, in May 2011, around the same time when Lil Tim was killed, Daniels was actually arrested for having a gun. Daniels was a drug dealer with many connections to the streets. And to avoid prison, he would begin to cooperate with the FBI, who were at the time focused on catching a gang called the Hobos. They were considered to be one of the most dangerous gangs in Chicago during the 2000s. In the process of informing the FBI about the Hobos, Daniels would also give police information about the AV. According to Daniels, the AV considered Welch World to be directly responsible for killing both Cess and Neef, and they wanted revenge. And they would try and get that revenge on the 3rd of August 2011. Around 5.30pm, 16-year-old Steve Barron, an alleged member of Welch Welch World, who had appeared in videos with affiliates of the crew, was hanging at the Metcalf Park near Welch World's Hood, a common hangout place for their members. This park itself actually has appeared prominently in numerous music videos from members of Welch World. He was on the basketball court playing with other people from the neighborhood, including a 13-year-old boy called Bebe, real name Darius Brown, a talented young player who, according to his family, lived and breathed basketball. According to Barron, he had just scored and his team was celebrating, when a white car rolled down the street next to the basketball court and someone would roll down the window, opening fire, sending everyone on the court running. When the shooting stopped, Darius had been hit in his neck, and although people in the park tried their best to save his life, he would unfortunately pass away later in hospital. Years later, Darius's mother would give an interview to the BBC, recalling the events of that tragic day and reflecting on how much violence had gotten worse since her son had killed. No, Darius has been shot, and I'm like, Darius has been shot? Like, it just didn't, the two didn't go together. I mean, like, he's a kid, 13, and then I'm thinking, okay, he's been shot, then I'm thinking maybe a BB gun or something like that. I just never imagine that it would be with a real gun, a real bullet, and that it would take his life. It's heartbreaking to see the violence day after day after day. And like I said, 2011, that was five years ago, the violence was not this rampant. And here we are five years later and nothing has changed. In fact, it's gotten worse. The friends of Darius, many of who were affiliated with Welch World, would begin calling themselves BBG, or Bay Bay Gang, in his honor. And even Tay would later recollect on how he used to often hang out in Metcalf Park, even though he didn't play basketball, just to watch Darius play. I don't even like sports. I used to come up there and just watch Shorty. See him? Shorty got nothing to do with nothing. I think he was like 10, 11 at the time, you see him? And they just shot, just shot through the gate, shot. You gotta see the street, bro. The street here, it's a sidewalk, a gate, a, a grass, and they just shoot through that bitch and shot shorty. The very next day after Bay Bay's murder, Baron would post on Facebook, swearing to avenge his death. The police, on the other hand, didn't immediately have suspects, but with the help of their informant, Neef's brother, Keith Daniels, they would eventually find out that three members of the AV were allegedly behind the shooting. Cess's brother, Jamal Streeter, Cess's boyfriend, Aramis Beecham, and another man named Vito Richmond. The real target of the shooting had allegedly been Baron due to his close affiliation with Welch World. And Tay would later even respond to rumors in a 16 shot him interview that he had been the target of the shooting, even though he was locked up at the time of the incident. It looked like some people probably like tried to like kill you or something like that, and end up, a, a baby end up dying or something like that. Yeah, bro, I wasn't even out. That's when uh, Seth's brother and baby Diddy, one of our baby Diddy, they supposed to shot up a park or something and, and killed the little, little boy, little raw ass, little hooper, little baby, raw as hell, you feel me? But I, I wasn't even out, I was locked up. 
Oh, so that was like a rumor what I was saying. Yeah, I, I went out. A few days after the shooting, Daniels would hear the AV members talking about the events and passing around a gun that had allegedly been used in the shooting. With money given by the police and a hidden microphone, Daniels would actually then purchase that gun from a member of the AV and bait the suspects into giving a recorded confession. The police would also recover a car used in the shooting, and later, court documents from the trio's trial would later show that Welchworld and the AV had engaged in a series of back and forth shootings following the death of Bebe, which is something that Baron would seemingly later refer to in a Facebook post saying that when Bebe died, they turned up for him. Meanwhile, after a botched retaliation attempt that killed an innocent child, the AV was still waiting for their most hated rival, Tay Savage, to get back on the streets. And in the weeks following the death of Bebe, one of their members would even post a mugshot of Tay to their Facebook with a dollar sign placed on his forehead, indicating that a price had been put on his head. And Tay would soon be out of prison, fresh home, with a price on his head and a serious reputation to live up to. But while Tay had been in jail, something very interesting had happened on the streets of Chicago, as in 2011, a young black disciple from Oblock named Chief Keith would begin making waves with his music and videos about his life as a teenage gangster in Chicago streets, with those videos first going viral locally and eventually all over the world. Within just a few months, the entire world would be watching the Chicago drill scene with interest as the gang wars in Chicago would become a trending topic and people all over the world would be tuning in to find out the latest drama on the city's gang-infested streets. And as the world began to learn about the deadly war in Welch world, soon too, the legend of Tay Savage would become a trending topic. Despite the rise of Chicago drill music in 2011 and 2012, Welch World's own rappers, the Buck 20 Brick Boys, were beginning to go their separate ways around this time, with Billionaire Black beginning to associate much more with the gangster disciples from 63rd like FBG Duck and Lil J. So at the time, Welch World would have relatively little representation in the city's now booming rap scene, with one artist called Lodi Bay, who would unfortunately not gain much popularity despite some undeniable talent, being one of their few new representatives in music at this time. But what is clear from the social media activities of Welch World members is that they were still heavily involved in the low-end gang war in this period, and the alliances that were formed before and during Tay's incarceration were still the same, with Welch World still being close allies with THF46 and OBN or the Oak Boy Nation, who was heavily allied with Welch World under their 0439 joint gang set, which combined both sets' main streets, 43rd and 39th and they were still beefing with the same sets, including 051 Young Money, The Rock Boys, Lake Park, aka Su Wu or TTB, Lawless, and of course, The Av. And it seems that the war in the low end was still preoccupying Tay Savage's everyday activities. Another Tay, Tay 600, who himself has ties to Welch World, would later reminisce in his YouTube Storytime video about Tay Savage, how Tay would even try and recruit members from his 600 set to Welch World, particularly one of their biggest savages, D Rose, who was made famous in the drill scene by Chief Keith, who would often shout out this young savage as one of his main shooters in the early songs. It was this and from his hood because they was in two of black he pulled up to my crib and was looking for D-Rose. He said, man, I'm bitty. This man told me, he said, I ain't gonna lie, on Welch, I want him. I want Rose. Tell Rose, I said, hit my line, man. Tell Rose, I said, come to me. I'm bitty. He said he got pipe, everything D-Rose want. I'm bitty, whatever Rose want. He got it for him. He gonna put Drake in his hand. He gonna put Drake, AIP, 30, whatever he wanna, whatever Rose want on BD, he, he, he got it for Rose. And I'm just looking like, man, what on BD? You better get the f on, boy. That Rose, our slider, he's sliding for us on King, baby. He ain't gonna be on the hill now. Hey, I'm talking for Rose and shit on BD whole time. Rose, 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 Rose on Biddy, he would have, he, he, he probably would have rolled around with Taker. Rose like other gangsters too, folks. On Biddy, but Rose like other gangsters too on King David, folks. This man come to my crib trying to recruit D Rose, folks. Just, it's just like, I'm just like, damn, I want Biddy, you, that shit mean that much to you, folks? Like, you don't got enough savages, enough guns, enough, enough this and that. You feel me? Like, you just, you just want, you just want more. Artillery, more savages in your circle, more demons in your uh, vicinity on BDE recruiting the gangsters. Meanwhile, Welch World's ops, particularly the AV, were equally invested in the war, promising on Twitter to drop bodies before the end of 2012. It would appear in the face of this complicated war, Welch World's ops were also clicking up. 
with all of these gang sets going against Welch World, The Av, aka FTB or Free The Burr, The Rock Boys or Rock Nation, Lawless aka Jamar World, aka The Boonie Boys, 051 Young Money, and Lake Park aka Suwu, aka TTB or Train To Blow, all being seemingly very close to each other, with three of them, The Av, The Rock Boys, and Lawless being particularly close to each other. Yeah, the Jamar Boys be young as Young Savage man, Ails. And then, in May 2013, something would happen that would arguably make all of these gangs even closer, as a beloved member would lose their life and these gangs would formally build an alliance against their enemies. Tory Stewart, aka Snoop, not to be confused with another Snoop that we'll discuss later, was a college student majoring business who dreamed of getting into home renovation after graduation. However, Snoop also had past ties to the streets. He grew up in the Lawless Gardens and was part of the Lawless set, even honouring their dead members in his social media handles. In 2011, a 17-year-old Snoop and his friend were arrested during a traffic stop for having an automatic weapon and drugs packaged for sale. Unfortunately, right when he was seemingly about to turn his life around, tragedy would strike. When on the 20th of May 2013, at around 8.20pm, a freshly turned 20-year-old Snoop was driving in his car in the Lake Meadows neighbourhood just north of Bronzeville, when somebody would open fire shooting at his car several times, with one of the bullets reportedly hitting him in the head. Snoop was taken to hospital in critical condition, but would unfortunately be pronounced dead that night around 11.40pm. Snoop's family would later give an interview to a newspaper, telling them how they used to frequent the park that Snoop was killed in front of, with this park being close to the Lawless Gardens, where they used to live. After Snoop's death, members of Lawless, as well as Rock Boys and The Av, would pay their respects on social media. They would even release a song that Snoop had made before his death with a Young Money member by the name of Rilla. This would be later followed by other songs dedicated to Snoop, including his friend Hard Knock's song, Lil N Word Snoop, and Young Savage featuring Boonie Boy Mook's song, Bitch We Snoop, where they would diss their ops, including Welch World. Meanwhile, Welch World rapper Lodi Bay would repeatedly diss Snoop on Twitter and insinuate that Welch World had something to do with his murder. The Chicago police were also seemingly treating Snoop's death as connected to the war with Welch World, listing his homicide as a reference in their reports regarding the murder of Sex. This would later lead to some Redditors believing that Tay Savage himself might have killed Snoop, while others would rightfully challenge such claims, suggesting that Tay would have been arrested for the crime if there was genuine evidence proving his involvement. But in any case, Snoop's death took place around the time as three of Welch World's main ops, Lawless, The Rock Boys and The Av, had allegedly decided to make their alliance more official. And so, sometime after Snoop's death, they began to refer to themselves as 757 on social media and in songs. With this name, the result of them using the last number of each set's main street to create a new name. The Rock Boys, who reside at 27th Street and State Street, Lawless, who reside at 35th Street and Rhodes Avenue, and The Av, who reside at 37th Street and Indiana. Take the last number of each of those streets and you got 757. Soon, also Welch World would get word about this new 757 alliance. Interestingly, when Tay would finally become a rapper years later, he would actually post a story on his Instagram insinuating that he had created 757, adding yet more fire to the rumours that he may personally have been behind the death of Snoop. Whether or not these rumours are true, there's one thing that cannot be denied, and that's the fact that Tay Savage was incredibly active in the streets during this period. However, unfortunately for him, his activities would be attracting the attention of the authorities, and they were just one step behind, waiting for him to slip up. And when he did, even if they couldn't get him for murder, they would make sure that they would put him away for as long as possible. By summer 2013, something strange was happening in Welch World. Tweets would circulate, suggesting that the streets had been quiet and that the only people out spinning the block for the gang was Tay Savage. Clearly Tay was active in the streets around this time, but so were the police, who had likely been paying very close attention to Tay ever since his name first came up in relation to the murder of Cess two years earlier. At the end of July 2013, Tay would be suddenly taken into custody after being asked by his parole officer to come to his office. Where were you at when you got arrested? When I got arrested for that, my, pr my parole, also said he needed to see me, so I went to go holler at him, and they locked me up. 
About a week after being taken into custody, on the 6th of August, Tate is revealed to be a suspect in an armed robbery and vehicular hijacking case that took place on the 16th of July. Tate and his co-defendant had allegedly approached two victims, telling them, you know what this is, while displaying a handgun. They ordered the victims to the ground and went through their pockets, afterwards taking off in one of the victims' car, a 1985 Chevy Monte Carlo. One of the victims would later identify Tay in both a photo array and a physical lineup. Interestingly, this alleged robbery took place practically in the heart of Welch World, almost exactly in the middle of their supposed 40th to 43rd Street territory. Later, Tay would reveal during his Say Cheese interview that one of the victims in this case was in fact a brother of a known Chicago rapper, C. Honcho. And the people who identified you was C. Don Honcho's brother? He was one of the guys? Uh, yeah. Okay, so he was like a witness type Nah, he was a victim. A, was victim. a victim, my yeah. bad, a victim. Yeah, he pointed me out saying that I poked him. The other guy, the other guy that was with him is a, was a regular civilian. He like a, a police officer. However, Tay's case wouldn't be considered newsworthy until November. According to police reports, on the 4th of November, when Tay was in custody, detectives would indeed take him to be interviewed regarding the murder of Seth, which would prompt Tay to ask the detectives what had taken them so long to finally come and get him. Tay would deny his involvement in the murder of Seth, but he would tell detectives that one of the theories was that Seth and Neef had killed his friend Welch. Soon after, he would invoke his right for attorney, and the interrogation was terminated. Two days after that interview, on the 6th of November 2013, the news would report that he would officially have been charged for the murder of Seth, and his mugshot would be circulated in Chicago news articles all about the murder. After this, Tay's cases would seemingly move slowly, during which time he would remain in jail, while his friends would post on social media demanding his release. However, in March 2014, local news would suddenly report that Tay would also be charged with the murder of Neef. Once again, a police report would reveal a movie-like situation leading up to this charge, with Tay telling the investigators who came to interview him, guess you're right when you said you'd come back for me. Tay was then asked to identify Neef from a photo, and he would tell them that he knew Neef, but was not friends with him. The detectives would also question Tay about his tattoos, one of them involving bullet cartridges and smoke, inferring that these tattoos were hinting towards his activities in the streets. Next, an interesting episode would occur, as Tay, or Dwayne, would try to deny that he was known by any nicknames, most likely knowing that one of the things that had since the beginning tied him to the murders was his nickname Tay, as several witnesses and other sources had since the beginning of the investigation named the suspect as Tay. Things would get uncomfortable for Tay when detectives would then talk to his mother, who would probably, without realising how such a small detail could hurt him, tell the detectives that he was indeed known by the nickname Tay. The detectives would also show Tay videos from YouTube of him participating in gang-related activities and being armed with a handgun. As far as the detectives were concerned, they had their man, so they would press forward, with Tay opting to take these murder charges to a trial, a gruelling process which he would elaborate on extensively in a Say Cheese interview. Tay would explain the order of the trials, with Sess's murder trial being first, lasting for less than a week. Which trial was first, Sess or Neef? They gave me uh, Sess. I went, I, yeah, I did Sess body first. How many days did this trial last? They was quick. They was like, I think a jury trial usually be like seven days. I think mine was like four days, both of them. Tay would explain how several witnesses pointed to him as the suspect, but other witnesses pointed also to other suspects, and ultimately the shooter was wearing a mask, which helped his case. The reason why they charged me because they had several people pointing me out on both cases. Several people pointing me out saying that I did it. That was with the victims. They was pointing me out saying like, yeah, he did it, he did it, he did it. You know what I'm saying? and I beat it because whoever did it had on the mask. Apparently the witnesses were the people who were with Seth in the car at the time of her murder, and they all claimed to know that Tay did it. But ultimately, since the shooter who did the murder was wearing a mask, he could not be identified. Them was the people uh. that was with her that was saying I did it, like I think her sister, a few of her friends, all of them were saying they went to high school with me and everything, and they knew that I did it, you know what I'm saying? But like I say, how I beat it was because whoever did it had a mask, so you saying I did it, but how could you say I did it if whoever did it had on the mask? However, it's worth noting that in the original suspect description, the mask was seemingly never mentioned by witnesses. Tay would tell Say Cheese that when he got his not guilty verdict, he was smiling and felt like he had been blessed. Man, I was just smiling. That's a blessing. I was just smiling. <clears throat> I was excited, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's a blessing. Because like I say, with that, it can always go either way. If you're innocent, if you're guilty or whatever, it, it still can go either way when you're in trial because it's 12 people that's on the stand that know nothing about the law. You know what I'm saying? So they, 
It's just who tell a bad story between the lawyer and the state. Despite this miraculous not guilty result, things were far from done. And according to Tay's No Jumper interview, Tay demanded a speedy trial in the case of Sess's murder. And when he beat it, prosecutors then decided to make an unusual move, bringing the robbery charges next in the hopes that they might have time to find more evidence ahead of the Neef murder trial. I demand speedy trial on the murder. Boom, now they come put another murder on. Before I could beat, they put another murder on. So now I beat that murder. So now the states got, they, they got the luxury to pick which cases. I'm fighting two cases. They could pitch, pick what, what case they want to trial first. So they elect on a robbery, mm. which is kind of weird. Like, it's a murder. Why you don't do the murder first? Because it's weak. And then, in a surprising turn of events, one of Tay's baby mothers and three of his Welch World associates would end up getting tied into the case, as they would be arrested and charged with witness intimidation around late November 2014. According to court proceedings from their cases, they had made indirect threats to one of the victims in Tay's carjacking case, implying that he would be shot if if he moved forward with his plan to act as a witness in Tay's upcoming trial. They were also allegedly involved in shooting the victim's brother, who had fortunately survived with just a hand shot. And later, they allegedly terrorized the victim's mother and aunt by coming to the victim's property armed with a gun. As police arrived to the scene, they would find and arrest the four defendants and recover a 9mm handgun. Following his friend's failed attempts to violently silence a witness, not to mention the terrible effect that this new witness intimidation charge would have on his reputation at the upcoming trial, Tay would ultimately end up copping to a guilty plea in the robbery and carjacking case before things got any worse for him at trial. And Tay would later tell 16 shot him in an interview that he was confident at first, but when his friends caught those charges, he had to change his plan. They locked my baby mama up and three of the guys. So I really was like, Frank, we gonna beat this. But then, <laughs> but then, but then some of the guys got locked up for, for tamping with the witness. Cause I think like both of them got shot. Both of my victims got shot and they was trying to connect it to me. And, so Frank just like, man, go on, cop out, there's too much going on. They got locked up and they get to run him. It was just a lot of The state would seemingly make an example of Tay since they couldn't get him on the cess murder, with the court stealing out a monster sentence of 20 years for this robbery, despite the prosecution dropping the original aggravating factor of using a firearm. However, due to Illinois' truth in sentencing law, Tay would only have to serve 50% of his sentence, which would still take an entire decade off his life. But despite this huge sentence, Tay claimed that this was all a tactical move in his No Jumper interview, suggesting that he wanted to get that case out the way, otherwise the state might have had him waiting as many as six years just to face trial before he could then face his next trial for the Neef murder. So I cop out to that. So I can hurry up and get that out the way because I don't want to, you know, stall three, four, five, six years on the robbery. A few people saying you did. I, they, ain't, they ain't had no on me on the robbery. They ain't had no, they said I robbed somebody, took their car, they ain't had nothing. They just had the two people they said I robbed pointing me out saying that I did. Mm -hmm. That's all I had. I guess that's enough to convict you. So I just copped out 20, 20 or 50 on that. So even with a 20 year sentence on him, Tay still had a murder case to be. The Neef murder trial was next. And once again, there were witnesses who claimed that Tay was the shooter in a lineup. Now the next one was, was Neef or Neff. And this happened in traffic. Yeah. And this one had witnesses too. Yeah. And all the witnesses claimed the guy had a mask on. No, at first, some of them were saying that I did. They said my name, pointed me out in the lineups. But despite seemingly strong witness testimony against Tay, the case had appeared weak since the beginning, with the detectives failing to even recover rather basic information such as Tay's Facebook account. Moreover, the gun recovered during Tay's robbery and carjacking case would not be a match for the gun used in the murder of Neef, closing yet another crucial lead that could have tied Tay to the murder. The police would also struggle to get the friends of Neef to help the investigation by testifying. And most importantly, once again in the Neef murder, the suspects since the beginning were reported to have been wearing ski masks. Again, making facial identification by witnesses practically impossible. Now that hits different when you realize that Tay actually has a tattoo of two masks with text saying, live now, die later. But hey, I'm sure that's just a coincidence. Anyway, despite the prosecution seemingly first attempting to claim that witnesses had recognized Tay as the assailant during a lineup, the fact was the shooter had concealed their identity with a mask. And it turned out that the witnesses only recognized Tay in general. And this is a contradiction with the fact that the shooter wore a mask, destroying the prosecution's argument completely. Ah, uh, you know how sometimes it'd be a police report. Now you can't always go out the police report because the police report is just what the police story. The police ask, did you know anybody in the lineup? Which the police do do that sometimes. They ask you like, do you know anybody in the lineup? Then you say him, you know what I'm saying? Then they, I right, circle this and put your initial back. They're like tricky with they, with their words or whatever. But yeah, I don't know. I just know I beat it. Thus, in the end, the case would turn out to be much like the first one. There simply wasn't enough evidence to place Tay specifically at the scene beyond a reasonable doubt. And once again, Tay would walk away with yet another not guilty verdict. Thus, despite ending up with 20 years for robbery, 
Tay had beaten both of the murder charges against him, scoring a miraculous result. And his lawyer would even victoriously post the result on their website, boasting how he had gotten his client two not guilty verdicts on murder cases in less than an hour. Now, Tay had actually employed the services of one of the top 10 defense lawyers in the state of Illinois, Frank J. Himmel, later telling his IG Live followers that he thanks two people for beating his murders, God and Frank Himmel. I ain't beat that case because my was keeping the honey because he was telling bitches and and and, and, and don't come to court. I beat them bitches because God and, and, and Frank Himmel. But this bulletproof defense did not come cheap. And Tay would later open up about murder cases costing as much as $40,000 to defend against and shouting out his lawyer Frank for looking out for him and not demanding upfront payment with Tay suggesting that he is still paying for his legal fees today long after his release. How much did you spend on a lawyer for all this? So that's the thing. So that's the thing. A murder, at least 30000 for one murder. You know what I'm saying? But Frank was so locked in with me. You know, he, he was with me. You know, like when I first got locked up, you know, we was paying or whatever. But, you know, people started getting locked up. People started dying and everything. But he was locked in with me. So I still owe him. When I, when I, when I get some paper, I'm, I still owe him. Ultimately, though, no matter the cost, you can't put a price on freedom. And Tay Savage had truly beaten the odds, getting not guilty verdicts on two separate murder charges, all while numerous people with connections to the incident swore they knew Tay was the killer. Unfortunately for them, however, whoever that masked shooter was that killed Sess and Neef knew exactly how to cover their tracks perfectly. However, due to the sloppiness of the armed robbery case, the Chicago police had finally gotten Trigger Happy Tay off the streets with a monster 20-year sentence. And so from 2014 to 2022, Tay would settle in to a long stay in prison, counting down the days until he would be unleashed back onto the streets of Welchworld with one of the most jaw-dropping backstories the Chicago drill scene had ever heard. Tay would claim that despite receiving a 20-year sentence for armed robbery, he would only really have to do 10, and ultimately ended up getting out even earlier after just eight years and nine months with good behavior and after getting his GED. That was 10 years. I had, I had a few years in already. I'm, I actually got out early, because uh, I suppose just be out like yesterday. <laughs> I suppose I got out like yesterday. Really? Yeah, but with good time, I got my GED in jail and all How long? I had 20 at 50 for, the, uh, for armed robbery. They dropped it down to armed robbery with no firearm. They dropped the gun enhancement, because it's a 21 year gun enhancement. So now it's a 6 to 30. They gave me 20 at 50. With good time, school and good time and all that, I, I knocked it down to like eight years, eight years and uh, nine months. So Tay would truly be able to beat the odds if he didn't get into too much trouble in jail. But even having to deal with a minimum term of eight years and nine months, Tay Savage would be settling into his life in prison for the foreseeable future. And he had been seen in pictures taken behind the wall, seemingly in good spirits. And even his ops from 757 would tweet saying that they miss Tay being on the streets and suggesting that gang life is boring when their top op is no longer around going on to say free Tay so that they can kill him and that they still have smoke waiting for him when he gets out. Some even suggesting that Tay is Welchworld's only hitter and that the beef had died down since he had been incarcerated. But that wouldn't be entirely true. Murders would still be taking place on the streets of Welchworld while Tay was locked up. On August the 15th, 2014, 25-year-old Walter Neely, known by friends simply as Walt, was out with a friend late at night in Bronzeville going to pick up some milk for his daughter. They were a block away from the Chicago Police Headquarters, which would usually be one of the most safe places in Bronzeville. However, Walt was an alleged member of Welch World, and here he was literally surrounded by enemies from almost all directions, with the Avs hood being less than a mile to the south, Lawless's hood being about half a mile to the east, and the Rock Boys about a mile north. According to news reports, while on the street, someone would approach Walt and his friend on foot and begin shooting at them. According to Walt's family, at this point, Walt had told his friend to run, while Walt himself seemingly stayed in place, ready to take on the attacker. Unfortunately, sometime later, Walt would be found by the police with a shot to his abdomen. According to the medical examiner, Walt would be pronounced dead about half an hour later in the hospital, but according to his mother, he was already dead on the scene. Afterwards, Welch World members and affiliates would once again pay their tributes on social media. Meanwhile, Walt's family would tell the newspapers how Walt had had a criminal past, but he had since turned his life around and was passionate about drawing art. However, clearly, for the enemies of Welch World, Walt was still very much an active member, and there wasn't a shortage of 757 members dissing him after his death. And as soon as the news was out, 757 members were claiming to be smoking Walt and Welch, with some asking if the W that Welch World members were rocking is for Welch or for Walt now, and mocking them, saying that it certainly doesn't stand for winning given how they were taking losses in the streets, while others were simply implying that they were gathering Ws, both literally 
and figuratively. Some even posted vines saying that they were smoking on Walt. There would also be insinuations that Walt had perhaps been dissing Cess and had even come to his ops hood looking for trouble like Welsh had allegedly done before his death, with his ops comparing the two on Twitter and saying that they went out the same way. These tweets are certainly making 757 look responsible, but despite the close proximity of the murder scene to the police headquarters, it first seemed like there were no suspects, with posters asking for tips being placed around the neighbourhood. However, about a month later, the news would report that two teens had been arrested and charged with the murder. Ironically, like Cess and Neef, another boy-girl duo of shooters. These teens were Kenneth Brown and Dreana Grooms, both only 16. Kenneth was known in the streets as Snoop and lived in the Avs neighbourhood, not to be confused with the other Snoop from Lawless who was killed in 2013, and Dre who lived in the Rock Boys Dearborn Homes projects. After these charges, 757 members would post again, lamenting the arrest of these young gunslingers from their block, even accusing people of snitching and continuing to diss Walt. Dre and Snoop would seemingly remain locked up while fighting their charges until almost three years later in 2017. 757 rapper Mono would give an update that they had actually beaten their charges, receiving not guilty verdicts, and would be coming home. However, a few days later, something had seemingly changed and it now looked like Snoop wouldn't be getting out at all, even after beating the murder charge. Dre, on the other hand, was freed and welcomed home by other members. And she would eventually get back on social media to celebrate her freedom. But the real shock would come several years later in 2021, when local news and eventually even magazines like Variety would report that Dre's life and fight against these murder charges would be being made into a movie titled after her real name, starring actors like Wanmi Mosaku from HBO series Lovecraft Country. Now, since then, there's been little updates about the movie, which appears to still be in production, but I've got no doubt that there's a lot more to this story, and a gritty movie based on a teenage female shooter from the low end is something I would definitely watch. But anyway, back to the story. Coming into 2015, Welch World would suffer another major loss, although this time it would be from their closest ally, OBN who still ran with Welch World under their 4390 alliance. Boss Rel had barely turned 16, but he was already a well-respected member in both sets, having been in the streets, getting in trouble since 13, and joining a gang at 15 according to his family. Boss Rel was particularly close with the Welch World rapper Lodi Bay, and the two would often be seen together, whether in the streets or the studio. However, according to Rel's family, they had moved away from their old home in the former Ida B. Wells homes to get away from the gang lifestyle, after Rel's older brother had become an unintended victim of gang violence, getting killed by a stray bullet when he was just 13. Unfortunately, this wasn't enough to keep Rel from returning to hang out with his old friends in Bronzeville, which would eventually lead to his death. On the night of the 12th of January 2015, Boss Rel, real name to Rel Campbell, was walking on the OBN's main street, 39th, also known as Pershing Road, when he was reportedly approached by two males who would open fire, hitting Rel several times. He was transported to hospital, but would eventually pass away from his injuries. Later, during his memorial, Rel's mother would reportedly struggle to come to terms with the image that the police had painted of her son, claiming that he was actually a hardened gangster who had been terrorizing the neighborhood for years with his friends despite his young age. And unfortunately, the terror suffered by Chicago neighborhoods was only going to increase moving towards 2016, as the murder rate began to rise sharply. Five months later, in June of 2015, the 757 side would experience a loss that would have a huge impact on them, losing another loved member before they would even see adulthood too. Sunno was another young but well-respected member who had been part of the Rock Boys for years despite being only 17. Sunno could often be seen dissing Welch by dropping the W hand sign, and he was seemingly very close with many members of the AF. Later, some Redditors have also claimed that it was actually Sunno who killed Boss Rel, as well as having killed another member of Welch World. In the summer of 2015, violence was rising in the city of Chicago once again, and in the early morning hours of Saturday the 6th of June, Sunno and his 757 friends were out at a party in the Bridgeport neighborhood close to their Dearborn Homes stomping grounds. However, after they left the party, around 2 a.m., an SUV reportedly pulled up next to their car and let off shots. They would drive away for a short moment before two males exited the vehicle wounded. The police would find Sunno, real name Richard Edwards, unresponsive after being hit by a bullet in the armpit. Sunno would die at the scene and his lifeless body would be left covered with a white blanket until detectives could finish their investigation, leaving his mother, who had arrived at the scene, devastated and unable to hold her son. And video of the absolutely devastating scene as Sunno's mother is being held back was captured and posted on Twitter by a news journalist.
the loss of Sano hit 757 hard, and already later that morning, rapper Mano would tweet a tribute to his friend vowing revenge, and others would follow, even reminiscing of a time when they had slid through their ops hood, including Welch World. And seemingly, only a few days after Sano's death, they had renamed their hood Sunnyside in his honour, a name that many of the rock boys would primarily represent for years to come. By 2016, the violence had truly erupted in Chicago. Whether the rise and popularity of drill music was influencing the violence is a question that academics and academics continues to research for years to come. But what we do know for sure is that in 2016, Welch World would lose yet another member, and this time it would be one of their only rappers, Lodi Bay. Lodi had been dropping songs and music videos for years at this point, all the way from 2011 when he was just a kid. Although he was seemingly never fully committed to just rapping, usually dropping a few music videos each year, such as the music videos for the track Soldier with Boss Rel, and for the track Off Top Freestyle in 2014, the Welsh World and OBN anthem With The Gang, as well as the now ominous I'ma Die This Way in 2016. All of these songs typically included many disses aimed towards the ops of Welsh World, particularly the sets in 757. The deadly year of 2016 was almost over, when Lodi and his family and friends were gathered for Christmas in the Chatham neighbourhood. They were gathered in front of a house to shoot dice, when someone in a grey hoodie came through the alley and opened fire on the crowd gathered in front of the house, hitting numerous people. The shooting would leave five people wounded, some in critical condition, but it would unfortunately kill both Lodi and his brother. This event would truly showcase the brutality of violence that had taken over the city, where savages are spending their Christmas day hunting for ops and not having second thoughts about shooting into large crowds of people just to catch their target. This senselessness and lack of hope was reflected in the comment that Lodi's sister gave to the news, saying that the shootings in Chicago don't even require a reason. And moving into 2017, disrespect would still fly between these groups of bitterly at war gangs. Friends of Neef, like Money Man, would still be dissing Welch in songs throughout 2017. In fact, during these violent years when Tay Savage was locked up, several rappers would emerge from 757 affiliated sets and build budding rap careers in the Chicago drill scene. People like Gunsmoke Gutter, 757 Wooski, 757 Mono, and 757 BA, just to name a few. But it wasn't just 757 going hard against Welch World in music, as even 051 Young Money, the other set that had a long-standing beef with Welch World, would use their music to disrespect Welch. With Driller's infamous Chicago anthem, 51 Dead Ops, featured a lyric where he warns his ops, don't get Welched. However, no matter how treacherous the beef between them and their rivals got in the music or the streets, Welch World's biggest target and threat, Tay Savage, would remain behind bars and unable to influence things on the streets during these years. But Tay these beefs wouldn't just be active on the outside, because inside jail, despite being on his best behaviour in the hopes to get an early release, Tay would still be getting into fights, with a minute-long scuffle later surfacing online in a jailhouse surveillance video that showed two people fighting on the upper deck, and fans would even see post-fight analysis from Tay and the man he was fighting in the form of jailhouse interviews on camera. Mr. Timberlake, yes. what happened upstairs? Why were you? Why wouldn't you stop fighting when I told you to? Fight? Yeah. Okay, do you want protective custody? Do you wish uh, to press charges? Do you wish to press charges against Mr. Bird? On an inmate Bird. Okay, that's great. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bird? Why were you and uh, the other inmate fighting? We planned, huh? Just playing, you weren't fighting? No. Why didn't you separate when I gave you loud verbal orders to separate? Because I didn't want to get slammed. Okay. Do you wish to press charges? No. Do you want protective custody? No. Thank you very much, sir. However, despite the negativity taking place both inside and outside the prison walls, it would seem that while in jail, Tay was still trying to keep a positive mindset. Tay would claim to have gained maturity in prison, claiming to have even tried to mentor other youngsters who were in there facing murder charges who he met inside. Because you went in and you were like, super young when you, when yeah. you first started that bid, and it's like you're becoming a man as time yeah, goes by sure. in there. Just, yeah. You felt yourself growing up a lot? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Then I started seeing young guys coming in like 16, 17, well, 17, 18. And I'd be like, man, that's crazy. And they wild like I was. So I'm like, man, that's crazy. You know, I'd try to holler at them, give them some little game. Like, but you know, they ain't trying to hit nothing. No. They trying to hit, they on what they on. Mm -hmm. But I still try to blow them. I'm like, man, you got to chill, man. Get some money, man. Watch, man. You want to be Because, look, I beat those. I beat those murders, you know what I'm saying? And that's a blessing. But it's guys that didn't. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I see, I'd be talking to them guys like, man, they I do or whatever. I'm like, man, that's crazy. But I, you know, it's like you stuck. 
like you stuck in her so now it's like interestingly enough one of the people tay would cross paths with in prison was none other than infamous chicago gangster and killer king von tay claimed to have originally met king von in prison around 2011 where they became good friends and people began to compare them to each other from the very start because people always compare you to von and say that like you know you, they sort of see the similarities in you guys's personalities or your background and you want to know what's crazy they said that when i first met him we was on so we was on uh in Division 6 on the school wing, the deck had went up or whatever. No, no, the deck didn't even go up. Something happened, they moved me. They just moved me to the next deck, and then Vaughn came. And they was like, man, it's this, this dude on, on the next deck that, that remind me of you. So I'm like, yeah, I'm cool. Hey, man, his name Vaughn, he from the O. I'm like, yeah. So now I see him, I'm like, I don't really, I don't really see it, but I'm like, all right, cool. I get to rotate with him, I'm like, yeah, I like this little dude. Mm -hmm. So we get to chopping it up, and then we got locked, we just locked. So you and Vaughn relationship came from being inside jail. Yeah, that's why I met him, man. But yeah. some of the guys knew him already, like from my area. But you know, Vaughn was a little younger than me. So some of the guys like around his age, they they, they knew who Vaughn was for sure. Tay would end up crossing paths with Vaughn during his 20 year sentence, even claiming that Vaughn had told him about his plans to become a rapper. You were in there with uh, King Vaughn? Yeah. We never was out at the same time. But we always be like exchanging words or I get out here, you know what I'm saying? But we always keep in communication. And he gets out and blow up. He said he's gonna do it though. He said he, he said that. Yeah, he said he's gonna do it. Raps was weak as hell when he first came out. In jail, weak as hell. He's finishing on the gallery. I'm like, bro, is you for real? He yeah. Oh, oh watch this. He did it. Tay and Von would keep in touch, and Tay would even post a handwritten letter that Von had sent him while in jail, with Von even drawing the Welch World W next to the O Block O and writing, writing the state bill. What's her name? Maria something. When the f Marco come back to the county, doing some real. Day. Whenever I touch and I come up and get right, I'll make sure you and every like us straight. I don't know. It's only a few. And you better go ahead and start working out because I can merge it. I'll beat your ass. I've been whooping and I'm cocky now. I'll knock you flat out. You my boy though, so I ain't even on that. But I love you broski. Keep your head up because these be quick to try to snake you. Free to real. Authority is everything. Loose lips, sink ships from a stretch game. AKA El Chopper, AKA Von Savage, AKA King Von from the Hole. Ultimately, as the years went past, Tay would get closer and closer to his release date, with mugshots and prison pictures surfacing in each year leading up to his release. In April 2020, Welch World members post that Tay is coming home soon, and his May 2021 mugshot would be the final image of Tay to release before the man himself. Meanwhile, outside in the streets of Chicago, the violence was showing no signs of slowing down making 2021 the deadliest year in Chicago since the mid-90s. This would also be felt in the low end, where the situation was indeed starting to resemble a 90s gang war. And one of the parties particularly taking a lot of losses was 757. In February 2021, they would suffer an enormous loss when one of their most loved and respected members and one of their first major rappers, Gunsmoke Gutter, real name Keontae Gregory Mollette, would be gunned down in the Grand Crossing neighborhood. The loss of Gutter hit 757 hard, and in the years to come, they have often mentioned him in their music, usually making it clear that they don't play about his name at all. But then, only a month later, another major strategy would strike, when another key player in 757 would lose his life in a crash-out mission by his ops that was so brazen that it would baffle even the most devoted followers of Chicago drill culture, who at this point had gotten used to pretty much anything. A member called Big Folks, real named Jawan Davis, was standing in line at a driver's license facility in the middle of the day when two men would approach him and start shooting, hitting him several times, which would eventually lead to his death after he was rushed to hospital. Meanwhile, the two assailants would escape in a getaway car, but would later ditch that car, attempting to carjack a Tesla, only to find themselves unable to figure out how to start it. The two men were soon arrested, and they would be identified as Matthew Givens and Cortez Hudson, who were better known in the streets as Lil Matt from OBN and Cortez from MTG 039. To a crime alert now, two people have been charged in connection to a fatal shooting outside a driver's license facility in suburban Chicago. Matthew Givens of Lansing and Cortez Tez Hudson of Oak Park were both denied bail. The men are charged with first degree murder and the death of 21 year old Juan Davis. Prosecutors say that Givens and Lansing were members of a street gang who targeted Davis because he was a member of a rival gang. Their actions that day became even more absurd when it was revealed that Cortez's six-year-old little brother was in the car with them when they arrived at the scene of the murder. The loss of big folks and gutter were a heavy burden to carry for 757, but unfortunately, they weren't the only ones who lost their lives in 2021. But eventually, 2022 would roll around, and finally, Tay Savage the Bully would be released back onto the streets of Welchworld, 
and it wouldn't take him long to realize that with his reputation in the streets, in the modern era of gangster rap and drill music, his backstory would be irresistible to fans of violent drill music, and he would begin his transformation from Trigger Happy Tay to Tay Savage, the rap star. Tay Savage would later speak on his time in jail, calling it a blessing that helped him see who were the real people in his life. I, I look at that like a blessing. That time I look at it like a blessing, you know? Because I was out here the whole time, there's a lot of people around me hating or, you know, funny feelings or... That time, it let me see a lot of people, like, it let, it let, you know how they say time reveal all? So it let me... I learned that now I'm, you know, I'm watching, I'm paying attention, you know? So that time really was a blessing. I, I came out on top, I feel like. I was fighting two bodies and a carjacking, you know what I'm saying? I did eight years off that. That was a blessing. Tay had truly been blessed to go from fighting two murders and an attempted robbery to being a free man once again after only eight years and nine months in prison. Tay would be released from jail on March the 18th, 2022, and announcing that he was back on Instagram. And Tay's ops from 757 would react to his release, telling him to come there and alluding to plans to have him killed. With Tay clapping back, saying he made the 757, a possible reference to the murder of Snoop, which led to the formation of 757, made up of the three sets, the Av, the Rock Boys, and Lawless many years before. Now, despite his back and forth with his ops, in the year of 2022, when Tay was released, he didn't let anyone scare him from getting back to his normal life. Deciding not to keep a low profile, but posting openly about his activities as a free man on social media. Posting a few pictures since his return home, with ominous captions like, the Splash Brothers are back at it, as well as one photo after his release with the O-Block Street legends T-Roy and Jay Munner. He would also post clips of himself working out after putting on some muscle in the prison gym, and continuing to post pictures to Instagram with spooky captions aimed at his ops, like this one with a caption saying that now after doing nine years in jail, his ops time is up. Tay would also post saying that it's been 12 years since Welch got killed, and showing that he's got Welch's son Lil Welch's back for life, with pictures of him taking him shopping. On the anniversary of Welch's death, Tay would post a heartfelt tribute to his fallen friend, saying, 12 years ago, we lost one of the realest to ever do this what we created was built on nothing but love and loyalty. So I'ma keep that torch flaming through your name till there ain't no more breath in my lungs. It's your world, shorty. We're just living it. Long live rude boy Welch. Welch world. Bricky gang. Rerock. Family of savages. But it wasn't all pain and sadness on Tay's timeline. He would be living it up, riding jet skis, and being seen out partying in Arizona with GD rappers Ruger and his day one low-end friend Billionaire Black. Unfortunately though, despite Tay being a free man once again and living his best life, the streets of Welsh world were still dangerous. As one of Tay's close friends, 30-year-old Le Parish Brown, aka Arab G, would end up being gunned down on the 1st of October 2022, less than a year after Tay's release, with the local news reporting of a man shot in the head in the 300 block of West 110th Street, and Chicago Drill social media pages reporting the death of Arab G from Welch World the following day. His death was followed by friends and Welch World affiliates posting tributes to him on social media. The 30-year-old was apparently training to become a trucker and get out of the streets, and one of the women who was actually in the trucking training school with him even made an emotional YouTube video reacting to Arab G's murder. I learned earlier today that an acquaintance that I went through training with at the job that I left recently was shot in the head and killed last weekend, over the weekend. He just turned 30. He had, his name was Le Parish. He wanted to get out. He wanted to get away from the violence. Unfortunately, the violence was far from over, and only hours later, another man, apparently affiliated with the NLMB, was also killed in the same neighborhood. Real name, Marquise Lewis, he was known as Lil Savage, and was seemingly friends with both Tay and Arab G, paying tribute to Arab only moments before himself being killed. The streets of Welch World were clearly as dangerous as they had ever been since Tay got home, and initially, Tay would seemingly be trying to remain out of the streets, explaining in an interview that initially, upon his return from jail, he was working in construction. Like a regular job? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was working construction. Yeah? However, Tay would later explain that he didn't like being told what to do on the job and that construction just wasn't for him. I like to be my own boss. You know, I don't like nobody telling me to go do too much. Doing, lifting this heavy shit. Yeah. I'm cool on that. Money, the money was too slow but for you? Ain't nothing wrong with a job. If that's what you want, if you want some Burger Man type stuff, it was decent. But that ain't really what I'm on. I, I, I'm 
I'm trying to own businesses, you know what I'm saying? I got the label going, the family of savages. So Tay would be looking for other opportunities to make money without the hassle of a 9 to 5. And so, in the latter part of 2022, before he had any ideas of rapping, it would seem that Tay Savage decided to continue living up to his nickname, The Bully, allegedly snatching a chain belonging to one of fellow Chicago rapper Polo G's artists, Young Liv, aka Livy. Livy had been seen wearing the chain off his record label in numerous videos and clips, and following the alleged snatching, Tay would begin to be seen on Instagram Live wearing the chain. Yo, they just said Livy going on bed right now. Livy's a bad car. They said real BB. Don't get the chain back. They said real BB. DMs would later leak, appearing to show Tay discussing the robbery. Meanwhile, Livy would come out to say that the chain had been taken from another person who had it whilst in Chicago, rather than Livy himself. Now, Tay would later be asked about the chain in a Say Cheese interview, where he claimed that it belonged to him. Now, the chain you got on, that's Young Liv's chain, right? That was my chain. However, he would later tell 16 Shotham that he took the chain after Livy got mixed up with some of his friends in the low end and that Livy probably got an insurance payout. Really, Livy got caught in the mix, bro. He got caught in the mix of something that ain't had nothing to do with him. You feel me? My green light of it. This is Livy chain. Livy got this, took off him. Oh, so the chain got in a video, another one? Gotta be. You know, he be having insurance and shit or something. I got a game, you feel me? Like, I'm going with it. Like, if you want your shit, bro, hey, it ain't nothing personal against us. You feel me? If you, if you want it, bro, just, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> You know, hit my hand, you feel me? Ironically, this incident would make for the perfect backstory to support Tay's reputation as the bully. And the following month, he would decide to fully capitalize on his budding reputation as a chain snatching bully in December 2022, posting a picture of himself wearing the snatched chain and claiming to be signed to the streets. This was Tay's first hint that he was planning to make an independent move into the rap game. And a few weeks later, at the start of 2023, Tay Savage decided to make a life-changing decision, leaning into the Chicago drill scene and beginning to make a way for himself as a rapper, as well as starting his own label, called Family of Savages. The crew's name would be abbreviated as FOS, and that moniker would also form the title of his debut song and music video. FOS would start out with a dubious disclaimer saying that props were used in this music video, and the music video would open with ominous shots of Tay's Family of Savages waving around prop guns with visible prop bullets inside what must have been prop magazines. In the song, Tay Savage would lean heavily into his street reputation. Using an intro from a now deleted street news TV, Chirac Street Legends video about Tay, where he described Tay as the Michael Jordan of the robbing game. Now, that's an appropriate introduction for Tay's music career, as he would later explain in a Dirty Glove Bastard interview. How it was that particular video that made him first realize that he could leverage his reputation in the streets to his advantage in the music industry, just like his friend King Von had done a few years earlier. You just leveraged your reputation. Yeah, that's I just, yeah, that's exactly what I did. So look, when I was locked up, a dude had did like a little, little um, street news TV thing. It was something like that. Not street news TV. It was like a uh, Chirac, Chirac, street legend thing. That's what it is. So uh, he had did that. So when I see that first, you know, people telling me in jail, so I'm mad. I'm like, what the damn? But it's so crazy. At the time, I was reading the um, 50 Cent book, The 50 of Law. You feel me? So, so, I'm, so I'm mad. Like, man, this tweaking man he trying to get me i'm trying to get out I'm like what are you doing you feel me but then he, i'm as, as i'm reading this book i'm like man how can i how can i try to how can i try to make that into a positive you feel me and, and, and the he said like man i ain't gonna lie when take him on we probably should rap so i'm like man I, i'm finna try to flip that because i know you if you got a street reputation you can get on the, on, on the beat and then say anything it's the guy's talented i'm talking about super talented they ain't got no motion Cause it's like they ain't got the image, but it's guys that's super garbage. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like this, like I he do anything, but he he it'll be taken off. It's crazy. So that's that's how I tried to turn that negative negative into a positive. For sure, and you already had the motivation from bro Von. Yeah, you already shout sure. out and did we did. Yeah, so you already knew it was possible. Yeah. As the video goes on, Tay would introduce the world to his gun-toting family of savages. This would appear to be his new crew, the next generation of Welch world who would have Tay's back in the rap game. A crew consisting of members who seemingly hail from the same neighborhood as Welch world between the 40th and 43rd streets in the low end. People such as Buki G, Take Some, and Lousy, who are part of a set called Bricky Gang, which consists of youngsters in the Welch world neighborhood. While surrounded by his family of savages, all toting props of course, Tay then begins to rap and introduces the world to his family of savages crew and labeling himself as the captain 
going on to rap about keeping something deadly in his pocket and his gun firing off so hard it knocked his arm out of its socket. I guess props got a kickback too. He also would claim that he stayed solid and served his 10 years in jail, all without snitching, earning him official G status on his block, as well as saying that he runs the low end and using his nickname The Bully to refer to himself. This was a bold entry into the rap game, and with Tay Savage's reputation actually backing up his lyrics, as a result, he would soon become a buzzing prospect in the Chicago drill scene. But interestingly, for the next few months, Tay wouldn't release more music, instead going on a gang-banging press run and appearing in interviews explaining his life story in the streets to numerous YouTube channels, including a legendary sit-down with DJ UTV in February 2023 that was many people's first introduction to Tay Savage the Bully, with many already picking up on the similarities and mannerisms between Tay and King Von. The following month, Tay would make an appearance on the song Send a Message with Buki G, with Chicago legend Lil Reese appearing in the music video alongside Tay, representing a major cosign. A few months later in May, despite not having released any new music yet, Tay would end up going viral for his reaction to someone else's music. As Tay's interview with 16 Shotton begins to be released, in one clip, Tay would be confronted about the daughter of Cess, the woman he was accused of murdering, Blasian Doll, with 16 asking Tay why he posted Blasian Doll's music, with Tay dropping the heartless comment saying, it was the least I could do. One of the murders you had uh, beat with the Cess, her daughter, a rapper, and uh, you had reposted her music. Was it like the reason behind it? Yeah, I just, um, want to support her. I feel like that's the least I can do. Tay would reference the situation with a dark tone once again in his Say Cheese interview, claiming that he shared her music because he saw she didn't have many followers. She ain't really had no followers, so I'm like, I'm a shit. You hear me? Whatever publicity is, is good publicity, whatever. No. So I really was sharing that count my heart, but you know. Say Cheese would even ask if Tay would ever sit down with Blasian Doll, with Tay saying there was nothing to talk about and that he's not surprised she doesn't like him. You ever plan to sit down with her? No, I ain't really nothing to talk about. I mean, she feels some type of way about, about everything. She's supposed to. Blasian would later respond to the rumors of Tay killing her mother in a No Jumper interview, where she claimed that most of the YouTube documentaries about her mother don't tell the full story. I'm sure you're aware of the reputation that your mom has because there's like multiple YouTube documentaries basically telling her story and everything But it's like, like they're not telling it right. What's, what are they that, telling about? And inferring that Tay Savage has come up off the back of embellishing the story of what happened to Cess, essentially saying he didn't actually do it. Well, I might as well just say the name since it's like he can cloud me. Uh -huh. I feel like Tay, he really like Tay Savage. pushing the sh mm. He never did it. That's why you keep saying allegedly. Mm -hmm. You allegedly did it, you never did it. Arguably, Blasian Doll was right. Tay Savage had certainly come up off the back of the rumors of being involved in Cess's murder, and disturbingly, it was working like a charm. A few months after dropping his debut track, FOS, Tay would follow that up with his booming new track, Gang Party, once again appearing in his video surrounded by mean-looking shooters. This came with a menacing hook where Tay would shout out his new crew, Family of Savages, and claim to be with the Steppers who kill their main ops and catch bodies. With Tay's repeated referring to catching that main body, perhaps hinting towards the 2008 murder of Kamein Fears, or the 2010 murder of Jermaine Streeter, aka Main Tain, which allegedly preceded the murder of Welch. Gang Party also had other references to details of Tay's murder cases, with him rapping that if you get too close he'll shoot, and that he wears a COVID mask when he shoots so that they don't know it's him, adding the ad-lib, no face, no case. Even going further in the second verse, rapping, pull right here and stop, I'm out on V, a reference to Vincennes Avenue where Neef's murder took place, followed by a lyric seemingly taking responsibility for the murder, with Tay and his whole FOS crew rapping, Mr. Walk em Down, shout out to Neef. This was a bold lyric, and one of the first instances of Tay boasting directly about the murders in his music. This bold approach, rapping openly about his murder cases, had a lot of people in the comments comparing him to King Von, and there would be endless other comments of people saying that Tay is going to be the next big rapper to come out of Chicago. Ironically, it wasn't just the comments pumping up Tay's image as the latest big rapping savage to come out of the Chicago drill scene, because at the end of May, fellow Chicago rapper turned comedian, turned serial entrepreneur, FYB J Main, appears in a viral interview clip on Say Cheese TV, where he hilariously tells the story of Tay Savage shooting at him in Chicago, frequently referring to Tay by the nickname from the famous Hollywood shooter, John Wick. He got this name, Tay Savage. Is this man even a savage? Nah, I ain't gonna front my move. Only reason I say he is savage is because of what I seen with my own eyes. It hit different. Y'all call him Tay Sav, bro. I call him John Wick. Tay would actually react to the interview in a later Say Cheese interview, brushing off the comments as lies and calling FYB J Main a comedian, but then admitting 
he did shoot at J-Main just like John Wick. We got John Wick. I mean, my bad. We got Tay Savage <laughs> in the building, man. <laughs> you told John Wick. He called you John Wick. And he even told stories about several nights in different situations. How credible was the FYB J-Main interview and in, in, in when it came to your name? Listen, J-Main is a comedian. You can't believe nothing he say. Nothing. There was, I mean, you was really John Wick that night? Was that? Oh yeah, I got all over his ass. Yeah, I got all over his ass. He know, he know what happened. Man, we hit his ass with the whoop. <laughs> we hit his ass with the whoop, that was it. Tate and J-Main would even end up talking about this incident in a face-to-face -face interview, with J-Main even confronting Tay in person about killing Cess after Tay said that he would beat the case of shooting J-Main because J-Main couldn't identify him. If Did I, you see me shoot at you? I seen somebody and I couldn't visualize their face, but I know it's you, Tay. No issue. See, I would have beat that. I would have beat that. See, I'm starting to believe you shot that girl mama, bro. Man, stop doing that, bro. Let's, now stop, stop, <laughs> come on, stop, stop. And Tay would even take to Instagram, adding Jay Main and reaffirming that a jury of 12 had found him not guilty of killing Cess. Now at this point, Tay was quickly becoming the hottest topic in the Chicago drill scene and he would follow up his viral interview appearances with solid musical output. In June 2023, he drops the track FaceTime, which came with a beat that's reminiscent of some New York and UK drill beats with its own Chicago flavor, and it's probably my favorite Tay Savage song. The music video for FaceTime opens with slow motion shots of goons waving guns around, and at this point, any suggestion that they're even props has gone right out the window. In the track, Tay would rap gritty bars, painting a picture of his lifestyle as a Welch world hitter, rapping outright that he stands his ground and kills people. He would rap about shooting women too if they get into his business, and proudly declaring that his crew run the low end, before launching into a closing hook where he says that he will shoot his ops in the face and end their FaceTime calls early. Once again, fans were captivated by Tay's drill raps that seemingly echoed the real life situations that he had been in. However, behind the scenes, Tay was beginning to receive some backlash. In the days surrounding the release of his new single FaceTime, Tay would be subjected to allegations that he was a snitch, after his earlier case files began to circulate on Reddit and wider social media, suggesting that Tay had snitched when he was caught with that gun as a 16-year-old due to the police report suggesting that he had told the cops that the driver of the vehicle gave him the gun when he realized they were being followed by police. However, some people would argue that this paperwork itself is false. However, Tay would seemingly admit that the paperwork itself was real in an IG Live with FBI by BJ Main, but he suggested that this was a police report, not an actual written statement from Tay himself. Till before we get into that, do, can you, can you, how much of this situation can you speak on? Because I be knowing there's certain situations that that you no, can't that, speak on. No, so what I'm gonna say is that's that's a real case. You see, and that's that's the first time I went to the joint as an adult and shit. Um, that that was my first real adult case, or whatever. But um, so look, this is what I want you to do. I want you to um read the the police report. You you got the police report over there, right? Okay, oh, hold on. Yeah, yeah. I got hold on. I got the whoops. Before you before you even read that, all right, listen, let me let me explain this to you. It's a difference between a police report and a statement. A police report is the police side of the story. You gotta always remember that. A police report is the is the police's report, is is the name. Okay. A statement is when you have how they got them a camera. Yeah, man, who out the band? He who out the band? Or when you got a sign really statement, got the okay. name. It, it, it's like a EP type. Regardless, clearly the wider Chicago rap scene didn't consider Tay as a snitch, and he would still be seen as a rising star worth associating with. As in the following month of June, Tay would officially collaborate with a veteran of the Chicago drill scene, Lil Reese, for their track We Run This. The booming track was typical Chicago drill, and despite Tay Savage counting many of the legendary figures in Chicago drill as his friends, an official track with a big name like Lil Reese put him on the path to being taken seriously as a rapper by the Chicago streets, as well as proving that the snitching allegations didn't really stick. And the pair would follow up that track with a sequel the following month, with the Trust None remix dropping on July 28th, 2023, which once again, saw Lil Reese and Tay Savage rapping back to back over a textbook Chicago Drill piano loop beat. And it wasn't just Lil Reese that Tay Savage was collaborating with. Also in June, Tay drops a collab with Buki G called Glocks 2. And then, in a very unexpected collab, in July, Tay Savage does a wholesome interview with British YouTuber Khadija after a chance encounter being there when she came all the way from England to interview Lil Reese. Why the hell is you going to different people who is interviewing people in Chicago? <laughs> 
Because <laughs> you lot, I rate you lot, I respect you lot. She would actually accompany Tay to the studio, even at one point putting on the stolen chain. This interview focused much more on the positive side of Tay Savage's life, specifically seeing him engaging with his Muslim faith. I'm with Tay and the guys, and it's super duper cute. We made a lot. And how are you feeling? Feeling good, feeling blessed. Feel refreshed? Yeah, keep, it's, it, it, this will keep me humble and keep me uh, on a straight path, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. However, despite Tay's new wholesome and God-fearing outlook on life, there would still be struggles in the dangerous streets that made him. Even though he would be spending more and more time out of state as his star rose, back in Chicago, the war on the streets would continue, with devastating results for some of the young men, still unlucky enough to be living on the front lines. Despite being out of state in Atlanta, Tay was taking his safety seriously, showing off an FNP90 machine gun that he had in the back of his car on an IG Live. 2023 would be an incredibly dangerous summer in Chicago, and numerous people would lose their lives in the month of June. Lil Roe from 757 had been seen on Instagram Live dissing his ops and saying he did a lot of stuff to them. He was seemingly depressed at this time, with one of his last posts suggesting that he was turning to drugs to cope with the pain of life. Days later, on the 10th of June 2023, Lil Ro would actually be out of Chicago in North Hollywood, Los Angeles, where he was gunned down in a drive-by at 1.30am in an alleyway on 10923 Magnolia Boulevard near Vineland Avenue, being pronounced dead at the scene with no suspects being found. He was later identified by the coroner as 20-year-old Deshaun Berry, known to his friends as Lil Ro. Blaise Doll would post on her story, saying she was heartbroken over the news and claiming to have been friends with Lil Ro since the sandbox, while enemies of 757 would seemingly post mocking Ro and saying he got put to bed, while others compared his murder in the alleyway from a drive-by shooting to the murder of Ricky from the movie Boys in the Hood. Since recording this video, in a shocking turn of events, a young man affiliated with Welch World by the name of Taurine Bartlett better known as Trench Baby, was arrested and charged with the murder of Lil Ro. Trench Baby is in fact the brother of infamous Chicago rapper Polo G, and these murder charges come just a couple of months after an August 2022 raid on Polo G's LA mansion, which saw Polo and Trench Baby being led away from the property in handcuffs, an apparent result of the police investigating Trench Baby for an armed robbery. But anyway, back to the original murder of Lil Ro, because within a few weeks of that killing, retaliation would strike, and two Welch World affiliates would end up losing their lives in the same month. On June the 23rd, a Welch World affiliate by the name of Turbo would seemingly lose his life, tragically only months after his father passed away. Real name, Derek Dillon, the 19-year-old was shot and killed in the 400 block of South Weber in Romeoville, Illinois, a suburban village 26 miles southwest of Chicago. The murder was the result of a shooting at the Scene 75 Entertainment Center where he was confronted by a 16-year-old boy. According to officers, a verbal dispute led to several shots being fired, killing Turbo and injuring another 16-year-old who was with him, with the teenage shooter alleged to be responsible for Turbo's death being arrested and held on a $5 million bond. Turbo was seemingly involved in the streets, having caught charges of possessing a firearm with a defaced serial number and reckless conduct, and his involvement in the gang war would seemingly be confirmed by his affiliates posting him on their stories, and members from rival set 757 posting Long Live Row in the aftermath of the killing of Turbo, with others claiming to have officially gotten get back, and some going as far as to say that Turbo tried to fight and got put in the ground after getting shot with a Glock with a switch. But that wasn't the only tragedy that would be associated with Welch World in the summer of 2023. Only days after the killing of Turbo, Lil Reese and Tay Savage's manager, Huncho from Welch World, gets killed. He had been close friends with heavy hitters in the drill scene like THF Bezu and Tay Capone. Real name Diedrich Baker, Huncho was found with a gunshot to the head in the 4300 block of South Cottage Grove, one of the main blocks of Welch World on June the 27th. In the days that followed, a 757 member repping Sessworld Neef Street, CWNS, appeared to claim responsibility, posting a pendant with Sess and Neef on it and the caption, this ain't over, and suggesting that there would be two funerals for their ops in July. Another post suggested that they run the low end, whilst others would post disrespectful images of Welsh packs, and some known to beef with Welch World made her post mocking them. However, one of these people, 051 Kiddo from Young Money, who himself was recently released from a lengthy prison sentence, would eventually take the disrespect to a whole other level when on September the 19th he released his song No Peace, which is likely a reference to the pushing peace movement that Tay Savage has recently engaged in with FYB J Main. So what's the conversation when y'all see J Main in here different, bro? Pushing peace, not beef. I f with the movement though, like pushing peace, yeah, yeah. I in the song, Kiddo raps about how Huncho got killed because someone, either Huncho or possibly Tay, was talking too much shit. 
He then ups the disrespect by bringing Huncho's mother into the mix, before ending the bars claiming that Huncho was moving too loosely in the city, seemingly implying that Young Money might have had something to do with his death. However, despite the bravado coming from Welch World's ops, there was seemingly retaliation for Huncho's death only days later, as news outlets would soon begin to report of the death of a 757 affiliate by the name of Ivo. According to Rum Report, he was shot in a drive-by while standing outside of a house with a woman, with 757 members seemingly mourning the loss of their friend, but unfortunately, the bodies would not stop dropping. Only about a week after the death of Ivo, on July the 8th, 757 would lose another one, when one of their OG members, Kenny Mack from the Av, who had been heavy in the streets all the way back to when Neef was still active, and had actually made a song dedicated to Neef and Sess all the way back in 2012, was gunned down near Chinatown. The summer of 2023 had been a bloodbath in the low end, proving that despite the decade plus since the tragic series of events that caused the deaths of Sess, Neef, and Welch, these bitter rivalries had raged on and been passed down to a whole new generation, obsessed with proving that they are just as deadly as the ones that came before them. It's a truly sad cycle of violence that continues to play out to this very day. And I have to stress once again that this gang lifestyle is nothing to glamorize or glorify. After seeing so many people gunned down and losing their lives before their time, it's shocking that anybody would actively decide to involve themselves in gang lifestyle. But the sad truth is, many people simply don't have a choice, and very few are going to be as lucky as Tay Savage when it comes to beating the law and surviving that gang lifestyle. In many ways, Tay Savage was the luckiest person to emerge from the low end, with his life and his freedom still intact, and he would now have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity as a rapper and survivor of the gang war to make a name for himself telling the stories of the dangerous life he'd used to live, rather than actually continuing to live that life. And luckily for Tay, right at the end of that deadly summer of 2023, he would come out with the biggest announcement of his career, revealing to the world that he had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to change the fortunes of himself and his family forever.